Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's professional development session, Creating a Canvas Course from Scratch. It's getting to be that time of the, uh, uh, of the year where fall uh, semester is roaring down upon us before we know it, uh, about a month from now. And many of you are probably thinking about either uh, getting a new Canvas shell ready for a course maybe you haven't taught or you haven't used Canvas with before. And, uh, or, and or refurbishing the Canvas shells you used last year and uh, bring them up to date and getting everything ready to uh, accommodate your students uh, at the beginning of fall term. And that's what we're going to talk about today specifically is creation or pop, uh, development of a canvas shell. Um, and we'll, we'll do it from scratch from a blank shell. And uh, because you'll need, no matter what you're doing, even if you're refurbishing an old shell, you'll need many of the concepts that we're going to cover today. But we'll assume worst case scenario where you have to build the course from scratch. So let's get started. All right, you've got to, when you faced with developing a canvas shell for a new course, you've got a few options. Uh, there's always the possibility that your department has a basic shell for your course that they give to faculty who are going to be teaching that course. Um, you, of course, would probably have to modify that, put your own uh, specific content in there, make it your own, but it might give you a big leg up in getting going. Or you may be able to find a wonderful colleague who teaches the same course, who has a canvas shell that's already developed and the, uh, who's willing to share it. Now that's a big ask because there is quite a bit of work involved in developing a canvas shell, but I've known so many incredibly generous uh, faculty at the district who share their, uh, their wonderful shell and the content therein freely. So there's always the possibility. It's worth a, worth a look, because that, as you're going to see today, that can save you a lot of time. You can also sometimes get a basic course template from your publisher. Uh, they Many of them provide you with a uh, Canvas uh, course shell template that uh, contains information from your textbook and allows you to pick and choose what you want to use and use that as a starting point. Uh, this is especially true if you're using uh, open textbooks from uh, the company called OpenStax, which has worked in a partnership with the, uh, the faculty at the California Community Colleges to produce can basic Canvas shells for each of their open source textbooks, which are of course free for your students to use online and uh, marvelous resources. So that's, all, and, but some of the for-profit publishers or some of the commercial publishers also will have this kind of content, something you might inquire of your publisher's rep about. Or you may be able to find a course uh, template in the Canvas Commons, a marvelous resource that you have access to through Canvas. Let's take a look at that. Just going to go into a Canvas shell here, the one that we're going to use today. Close your eyes as I scroll madly here. <laughs> I don't want anybody getting motion sick. Uh, here's the shell we'll be working in today. And the Canvas Commons is accessed through the global access menu here on the left side of every Canvas page, the gray bar. And the Commons is right there, so labeled. 
And it's a, an incredibly rich repository of online instructional content that people mostly, what we have access to is mostly stuff from uh, our colleagues in the California Community Colleges, but there's also content in here from all around the world. Uh, there are what, as of right now, 234, 726 <coughs> items of content that you can use freely. These are freely shared. Uh, you can put this material into your own course shell and use it. Uh, in some cases, you'll be asked to give attribution to the people who created it, but that's usually the only restriction in doing so. Um, the types of content that you can um, you uh, that you can find include, uh, you know, basic items of content like images and Ooh. documents, canvas pages, but also videos, audio files discussion topics pre-created, quizzes, homework assignments, entire modules, or even entire courses. And there are a lot of those in there. And you can take this content and import it into your Canvas shell and keep what you like and throw away what you don't and uh, get a leg up in developing your Canvas shell. You can, of course, search by keyword for these, you can put in a, a topic like chemistry. The only thing I actually have any academic credentials in. And this just, oh, what do we get? 1800, over almost 1900 uh, learning objects um, having something to do with chemistry, including a number of uh, courses. Uh, they vary from uh, graduate level to um, elementary level, but you can run through, you can pick up what you like. Let's take a look at this graduate mastering introduction to chemistry course. That's not usually something you take in graduate school. I'm curious. I can examine the, oh, this is a module. I take that back. That's not a full course. Uh, but here's a, let's see, D, D, D. I saw an AP course here, which is probably a pretty good, uh, or here's an undergraduate, that's a document. Let's see, where'd that AP course go? Or here's all grades and a chemistry course. Uh, we can look at the course by clicking on the title to it. And we'll see the basic structure of the course, the modules, the assignments, pages, and so on. We can page through this. We can uh, look at the content to our heart's content. If we like what we see, we can just click this import download button over here. And then we're given a list of all of our course shells that we have. Hopefully you don't have that many unless you've been around here as long as I am. And um, you can just pick the course that you want to uh, load this into. Like the one we're in right now. Let's see. Oh, I'm not going to worry about that. We'll just pick one at random here. You can just select the course or course shells. You can load this into more than, if you have two or three course shells on the, in the same topic or in the, for the same course, if you're teaching two or three sections of the same course, you can select more than one of these at a time. And then just at the bottom, just click import into course. And the next thing, within five to 10 minutes, you'll be able to go back to your course shell and find all that content sitting inside it. Not going to do that right now and wait on that. But the there's a vast amount of shared content in the Canvas Commons that you have free access to. But sooner or later, uh, you're going to have to develop a Canvas course from scratch. So. My wife's a children's librarian, so 
all the wisdom of the world can be found in children's literature. So um, that's what we're going to cover today, how to develop a Canvas course from scratch. Because even if you do get a leg up on developing your Canvas course in one of these other ways, you're still going to have to add your own, some of your own content and, and make the course your own to be effective with it. And you're going to need the skills we're going to look at and demonstrate today. Um, a little bit about development shells. You will receive your teaching shells, your, your Canvas courses that you're going to teach from about, on average, about a month before the beginning of the next term. There are technical reasons why we can't provide them earlier, not having anything to do with Canvas, but having to do with PeopleSoft. And uh, so we, we, we give you those teaching shells as early as we technically can, but that's not really enough time for you to develop a course fully, at least it'd be nice to have a lot more time than that. If you know that you're gonna be teaching um, a certain course the first time and maybe two semesters or something like that, uh, two semesters later, uh, you can, you'll can. you wanna start working probably on developing your Canvas shell, uh, whether you're teaching asynchronously fully online or whether you're just using Canvas as a supplement in a face-to-face -face course, you'll still want some time to develop that Canvas shell. And we don't want you to have to wait until the teaching shells for the next term are available to get started on that. So we offer what are called development shells. They're basically just uh, sandbox shells in which you can develop your course. You can put all your content in, you put all your assessments and get everything ready to go. And uh, then when you get your, and you can get this development shell at any time. By, and I'll show you how to do that. But once you've developed the course in the development shell, uh, a few days to a week or so before the beginning of the next term, you can copy all of that work into the um, teaching shell for the next semester. And that process takes maybe 30 seconds to a minute of your time. And uh, it is very, very simple. I'm going to show you that. That's the last slide today. <laughs> but it's very simple and very quick. So we strongly encourage you to work to develop your course in a development shell. There's another reason for that as well. If you wait, uh, perhaps you don't get the assignment <laughs> to teach until less than a month before the beginning of the term. I know that's happened to some of you. I can see that in your faces. And um, you decide to start developing your course in your teaching shell. And somebody in the registrar's office decides they need to change the CRN on that course, or there's some other reason they have to alter the the course record for that course in PeopleSoft. And they do that. And all the work that you've done in your teaching shell up to that point vanishes. You wake up one morning, you spend hours and hours and hours working in your teaching shell, and you open it up and it's blank. Because the automated process that integrates PeopleSoft with Canvas that automatically creates those shells for you has just replaced that shell, that shell you've been working in with a new blank shell. And that's not real good for your blood pressure. I hate to see anybody have a stroke over that. We've, we've had some people contact us in quite in, uh, in a frantic state. We can usually get the content back for you, but it's uh, it's a hassle for everyone. And it's, uh, like I say, there's no re reason to risk an ischemic event over that. So it's much safer uh, to develop your course in a development shell and then copy the content over at the last minute. Well, we just covered why to use a dev shell. 
Uh, you also have a pristine copy of your course content, which is never touched by students. <laughs> students never see that the, the, never see that development shell. You're the only one who can access that or a system administrator. And we have no reason to and won't without your permission generally. But um, it gives you a pristine copy of the content that is never touched. So you can use that development shell next semester as well. And um, it is safe from course edits and people soft. Nothing will ever happen to it. That shell will never go away. And, unless, and the content within it will never go away unless you willfully delete it yourself because you want to clean it out and start over from scratch. But nobody else is going to do that. So your content is safe in that development shell. You can get a dev shell anytime you like. You can get as many as you like. All you have to do is go to the Canvas help menu and use either the phone support hotline or the chat and just ask, tell, identify yourself as a faculty member at the San Diego Community College District. They'll probably ask for your ID number so that they can verify that you have an account in Canvas. Then they'll make you however many Canvas uh, development shells you wish while you wait. Takes only takes a few minutes. You'll find those uh, numbers and links in the help uh, menus for Canvas, which are also accessed through the global access menu on the left here. And uh, I've got a few more than you may see, but the, there is a Canvas faculty support hotline that you can call 24-7-365. Yes, if you want to uh, a development shell at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning, you can get it. You probably get the B team <laughs> at that time, but they should be able, they should be competent to make you a canvas shell. Or the, <laughs> no, we won't, we won't go into what might result in someone ending up <laughs> working at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning. Um, there's also a faculty chat. Let's see, where is that? Yeah, chat with Canvas support, a uh, text chat. And you may, at certain times of the day and certain times of the year, that may be a little quicker than the uh, than the telephone. You may get, you know, maybe spend some time waiting on hold. If you ask for a development shell the day, <laughs> like the day before half the country starts classes the next morning. But that help, you can always get those development shells, no problem. Uh, there's only one downside to a development shell. Um, if you use uh, publisher's resources, uh, like uh, publisher's tools, like my whatever lab, my math lab, my uh, uh, English lab or whatever from Pearson or any of the uh, similar products from other publishers, you can't pair the uh, development shell or you don't want to pair the development shell with the publisher's resource. You want to do that with your um, uh, teaching shell. So in that case, if you use that sort of resource, you'll want to put everything that you can into a development shell. And then perhaps as soon as you get, or with plenty, of, leaving plenty of time after you get your um, uh, teaching shells, you want to, you'll want to move the content that you already have in the development shell over and then go through whatever you need to do to pair your uh, uh, teaching shell with the publisher's resource. And in some cases, there's a fair bit of, of development that takes place after you do that. So you'll want to do that as early as possible and just keep, you know, keep your fingers crossed that PeopleSoft doesn't bite you. So that's the only caveat about using development shells. So creating a shell from scratch. 
in can or developing a shell, I should say. You don't have to create those shells that are created for you. You have to fill them. Because what you get when you get a development shell or when you get a new teaching shell is a blank shell, nothing in it. If you've taught the course before, you can copy and you have an earlier uh, teaching shell that is up to date. You can just copy the content from the old teaching shell into the new one. With the but probably better off copying it into a development shell and then copying into the new shell right before the beginning of the term for reasons I've already stated. But you <coughs> won't necessarily have to develop a course. And you certainly won't have to develop a course and shell from scratch if you've taught it before and you have a an up-to-date course shell whose content you want to use. You can just copy that content forward. But let's say you have a new develop, a new um, prep, a new teaching assignment that you've never taught before or, or you don't have a canvas shell before uh, for, and you need to start from scratch. The first thing you'll do is create modules using the modules tool. And we're going to go through this in Canvas Live in a moment. Content in Canvas is organized in what Canvas calls modules. Modules are um, collections of related links to content, to assessments, to communication tools within your course. And it's through the modules that your students access your instructional content in Canvas, your assignments, and things like that. Uh, modules, we'll talk more about how you can organize modules and so on, but typically a module contains a series of related links, all related to the same portion of your course. Very often, you'll the first module you'll create is some sort of welcome or getting started module, where you cover the where you present the information that you would normally present during the first day of class, when you greet your students for the first time and hand out the syllabus and introduce yourself and tell them what they're going to have to do to make an A in the course, or, or as my old friend Joe Green used to do, look piercingly around the room and say, someone has to fail this course. Might as well be you. <laughs> I don't think we get away with that anymore. Um, the, you can provide them with that sort of content in a getting started module. Things like syllabus, instructor information, maybe an icebreaker discussion to get everybody communicating with one another. And maybe a quiz to see if they read the syllabus or not. <laughs> and whatever else you normally do. Um, then you'll probably create con so-called content modules. And they'll ideally, they will contain links to everything that the student needs to access in your course. The modules are designed to be a one-stop shop for your students. And that's good, uh, good modular course design makes it so much easier for the students to find what you need them to look at or need them to do. It gives them confidence in how to get started and how to proceed through the course so that they're never in that awful situation of not knowing what to do next and, and floundering around trying to figure out how to proceed in the course. That'll drive a student out of a, an asynchronous online course faster than anything else. And um, the modules will contain links to everything. They'll contain links to your in the content that you want them to read or view or interact with. Uh, uh, they'll contain links to assessments like homework assignments quizzes or graded discussions. Um, and typically the content modules will be more or less consistent uh, from one module to the next in what they contain. So the students are get comfortable with how your course content is arranged. And 
how many modules you have and what you put in each one is determined by your logical, uh, the logical subdivisions of your course content that you like to uh, use. You can have a module for each week of the course uh, and uh, put all the content that you would present and all the assignments and so on that you would assign that week into that module and then have another module for the next week and so on on through the course. Or you might organize by chapter in the textbook and have a, a, a module for each chapter or perhaps each couple of chapters or depending on how big a chapter is and how many you have um, so that all of the content everything that the student needs to access in that logical part of your course is available to them in that module. Or you, uh, you may just organize it by topic. Up to you. Or you may have another idea entirely. But you want the modules to be organized in such a way that it makes sense to the students as well as you, and that the students know how to proceed through the course. And that's what a module looks like in, in Canvas. And we're going to do all this here in a minute. And oh, I, I've muted you because we had some background noise early on there, but please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. So how do we build a content module as opposed to the getting started module? This is a module where you actually include um, instructional content for a particular part of your course. Well, you're going to add links to content to the module. And that content might include, and this is this list is by no means encyclopedic, but uh, it might be lecture notes, PowerPoint presentations, assigned readings, lec video lectures, video tutorials, links to Zoom meetings. If you're going to, if you uh, have <clears throat> if you use Zoom in your online course or in your face-to-face -face course, for that matter, if you do um, uh, problem sessions or test reviews or something on Zoom live, or if you lecture live in Zoom, if you have a, a, a synchronous, online synchronous uh, course where you the students have to show up for class meetings, or if the class meetings are optional, whatever, you can put links to them in your modules and just all sorts of other stuff. Okay. So let's talk about implementing this uh, and show how that's done. I'm gonna go into a uh, development shell sandbox in Canvas here. I just go to my dashboard and you might want to close your eyes for just a second while I scroll madly down to this. Okay, it's safe now. <laughs> I've had people get ill <laughs> watching that. Um, this is a blank shell, blank canvas shell. This is what, what your development shell or your new <coughs> teaching shells in Canvas are going to look like. Uh, a, that dreaded blank sheet of paper <laughs> that you just rolled into the typewriter. If you're as old as I am, you remember doing that and uh, thinking, now what? <laughs> well, the first thing you're going to do, almost certainly, is create your first module. And the, the canvas is set up for that. You have this, you're automatically dropped into the modules tool, which is accessed otherwise through the course menu over here on the left. There's a modules tool. You click on that, you'll come back right to where we were here. And if there are no modules, if it's a blank course, you got this big button here that allows you to create your first module. Or you can use this plus module button over here in the upper right, which you're going to use to create subsequent modules. Um, but Instructor tries to make it as easy as possible to make your first module. So you just click that big button and you get an add module dialog box. All you have to do here is give the module a name. 
You can call it anything you like, just something that will make sense both to you and your students. If this is the first module, uh, probably it'll be something like welcome or getting started or module zero issues <laughs> sometimes the the very first the, that first or first day uh, you know the first bit of information that you give your students when they when you first meet them just i like to call mine just getting started question oh somebody just clearing their throat there let's make sure we're okay we're all muted Okay, so I'm just going to call it getting started. And that's all I have to do. I just name it and add it. Click the add button. And I got my first module. It's empty. <laughs> it's just an empty uh, box to which I can add links to content. I can add content to Canvas through this tool and links to it that the students will use to access. Um, I'll probably want to publish this module right off the bat, so I don't forget to do that. If I don't publish something in Canvas, I can see it, but the students can't. So I'll just publish that right off the bat. The little slash circle there, if I click on it, turns into a green circle with a white check mark, indicates that this module is published and students will be able to see it when they eventually are uh, given access to this content. Now, they'll never see it in your development shell. Your development shell will never have students in it. But when you copy this content over into your teaching shell, the published status of the module and the content within it will transfer over. So it's hey. a good idea. Yes. I'm sorry. If I'm working on the acting shell now, and the fall doesn't start until August 22nd, will they be, if the students register, will they be able to see? If I publish it now? No. No, that's a good question. Uh, well, and of course, you do have to publish the shell itself. Uh, nothing will be visible to the students if you don't publish the shell. And I'll go over that process in a little while. It's a, just a button on the home page of the course that you click that says publish. Um, students will not be able to see anything in that, inside that shell until you publish it, period the shell until you publish the shell as a whole. Also, even if you publish the shell as a whole, the students will not be able to easily access the information in the shell until the first day of class or the start date of the course. If they're really persistent and uh, clever, they can access some of your course content if the shell is published before the first day of the term. But it takes some effort. Most of them don't spend that kind of effort to do it. Um, so you don't have to worry about publishing content within the shell until you publish the shell as a whole. Good question. All right, so, so we have our first module. So how are we going to add content to this module? Well, usually the Canvas interface is fairly intuitive. What do you see here that would allow you to add content to this module? Anybody? I'm going to make you think about it. <laughs> Active learning, right? What do you see here that suggests? There's a bunch of arrows, and there's a click on choosing file. Right? You could do that, though that's kind of a limited, that gives you limited access to uh, tools, it limits what you can add. How about the download button? Uh, oh, boy, sorry, that's, I forgot that. I forgot to turn off that. That's not something you'll normally see. That plus yeah, sign? That's a, uh, that's a um, Chrome um, app that I'm running that gives me that. But somebody said it. Plus sign? Right, uh, the plus sign, right. Add plus, right? This is how you add links to this module or content to this module by clicking that plus sign. I wish they 
that that plus sign had some sort of little um, um, label on it so that you knew what that was for. It's fairly intuitive, but it's not a sure thing. And once you use it once or twice, you use it so many times that you never forget it, but it would be nice. Anyway, if I click that plus sign, I get a so-called add item to module box. And this is what you'll see over and over and over and over again as you're adding content and assessments and other stuff to your module. So before we actually get started doing this, let's jump back for a second to the PowerPoint slide. And we'll talk, we're gonna start off talking about adding instructional content to the shell. Um, lecture notes, PowerPoint presentations, things you want the students to read, things you want them to watch in order to learn the material that you're presenting in the course. Either as their primary source of content delivery or as a backup to your lectures in class or live on Zoom. Canvas is useful no matter what modality you're teaching in, whether you're fully face-to-face -face in a classroom or you're fully asynchronous online where everything is delivered through Canvas, or you're, uh, but also useful if you're teaching online synchronous where you're lecturing through Zoom, but it's still wonderful to put content online for your students that they can access 24-7, 365, whenever they need it. Or if you're teaching face-to-face -face in the classroom, Canvas still makes a wonderful supplement to uh, your efforts in the classroom because you can only be with your students for so much time each day. You can only cover so many things. But the um, Canvas is a wonderful supplement in that regard. Call that a web enhanced course. So um, in order to get this instructional content in, and I'm as opposed to assessments, you know, homework assignments, things like that, or communication tools, whatever. What kind of content can you put into Canvas and how do you put it in there and share it with your students? Well, this little graphic here kind of outlines the process, but let's get uh, a little bit more information here. What kind of links, content links, can you create in your Canvas module? Well, you can link to computer files, files that you have, uh, this normally means files that you've either created outside of Canvas, offline, or perhaps acquired from, you know, downloaded from something somewhere else off the web. Uh, files like um, Word documents or PDF files that you've created from your Word documents or that you've downloaded off the internet, PowerPoint slide decks, uh, PowerPoint presentation, DocX file, or uh, PPTX files. Um, <coughs> and these are only three common examples of the types of computer files that you can load into Canvas and place a link to in, the, in your Canvas module you can upload almost any kind of computer file. I, mean, I can't think of a type you can't upload to Canvas and share that file with your students. You do have to make sure that if you are putting up some sort of esoteric file type, like a say an AutoCAD drawing, you have to be sure that your students have an application on their computers at home that will open this file after they click on the link in the module to that file and download it to their local computer. You don't have to worry about that with common file types like Microsoft Office files, uh, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, um, PDF, uh, Adobe Acrobat documents, um, because Canvas has viewers for those built in that are on the server. 
that will display the content to your students without the file even having, even having to be downloaded to their local computer. But if it's something uh, more unusual that is not used by everyone, um, some kind of proprietary file from a program that you're teaching the use of in Canvas, uh, you need to be sure that your students have a way of opening those files. So how do we do this? How do we upload a file to Canvas that we want to share with our students and make it available to them? It's dirt simple. We start here with our add item to getting started box. And we're going to start inside that box with this add item to module menu here. And if we open this menu by clicking on the little down carrot here, we get a list of things, of things that we can add to our module for our students to access, including homework assignments, quizzes, discussion topics, text if we just want some information in the module, a, an external URL, which is French for a web link, a link to some content outside of Canvas on the World Wide Web somewhere, or a content from an external tool like a publisher's resource, uh, like my whatever lab, or um, perhaps a video, uh, perhaps YouTube, or a Canvas Studio or something like that. But the two most important content types are files that we're talking about right now, and Canvas pages, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. But let's talk about files. Let's say you have some content on your local computer that you have created or downloaded from somewhere or somebody's given to you that you want to share with your students. Like what's a file that you're going to share with your students in the getting started module? It's probably the first thing you do on the first day of class. The syllabus. The syllabus, thank you. <laughs> and uh, no, uh, I didn't pay her to do that, okay? <laughs> she came right up with that. Um, thank you. So if I wanna add my syllabus to my getting started module, I just click, and, and I have my syllabus in a Word document that I've created on my local computer. I just click the file option in this menu, and I'm given an option to create a file. Now that's kind of misleading because you're not creating this file, you've already created it in all probability, and you're gonna upload it from your local computer. So I, I really should probably say upload file there, but they didn't ask me. So uh, if you click where it says create file, the dialog box changes a little bit. and You get this button that says choose files. And if you click on that, Canvas will open up a uh, file manager dialog box on your computer. Uh, in this case, this is File Explorer on, the, on Windows. If you're on a Mac, it would be the Finder, but it'd look pretty much the same way. And you just need to navigate to where you have your content stored. Like in this case, I might have it in my documents library. And I have this little folder here that contains files that I use for this uh, seminar. So uh, that's, I know where I, that's stored there. So I open up that folder, subfolder with a double click. And somewhere in here is a screencasting syllabus, bingo. Uh, I'm gonna be creating here, a, a, or starting to create a course to teach people how to create screencast videos, which are some of the most powerful instructional tools there are, particularly in online courses. And I already have that course created, so I can use it as an example, but I'm gonna recreate parts of it here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna select that syllabus and click open. That tells Canvas 
what file I want to upload to Canvas from my local hard drive and where to find it. Then, once I've done that, don't worry about any of this stuff here. Once I've done that, all I have to do to actually execute the upload and create the link to this file in this module is to click the Add Item button. The file uploads very quickly, depending on the size of the file and the speed of your internet connection. And the next thing you know, you've got a link in your first mo in your getting started module here that has your syllabus in it or that's connected to your syllabus. Dave, if, I have a question. Go for it. Um, is this process different if you're using Google Docs? Good question. Um, Google Docs will provide you with a link, a web link to a document. And you would probably use, instead of uploading a file, you would create what's called an external URL or a web link to that Google Doc. And I'll use that as an example when I show you how to uh, uh, create a, uh, an external URL link here in a minute. That's a great question. Okay. Okay, excellent, thanks. All right, but this here we have a file that was on our local hard drive. And of course, if you have a file on Google Docs, you can always download it to your local computer as a Word document as well, if you want to do that. But th there's no need to do that. All right, so if a student comes along later and clicks on that link, here's what's going to happen. It's going to take a moment. Canvas is going to load a viewer for that file since it's a very common file type. And within a relatively short period of time, I've got a lot of scroll bars here because I've got this um, enlarged so that you can see it better. But here's my syllabus. That's not much of a syllabus. But the student can read the syllabus without having to download the file to their local computer and wait for Word or some kind of application that will open a Word document to open up on their computer. So they see the content a lot faster if it's in the form of a Word document or some other common file format that Canvas has server-side viewers for. On the other hand, if the student wants a copy of the document, that they can store on their own computer and read offline later when they're not connected to the internet. They can download a copy of this file just by clicking here. And they get a file save dialog box and they can save that to their local hard drive. So they, if you upload a file to Canvas, the students have the capability to download it and keep a copy on their own computers. You may or may not want them to do that. So if you don't want them to do that, you probably want to look for another alternative uh, to uh, supplying files uh, to your uh, students or supplying instructional information to your students. And that uh, that's going to be the next thing we're going to talk about creating, a, a Canvas page. But anyway, this is all there is to the student accessing that file. Then we can jump back to the modules here at any time, as can the students, by clicking on the modules link in the course menu. And there's our uh, first file link. You can upload any sort of file you like and link it into your module. And the student can click on that link and get the file and view the contents of the file. By default, Canvas labels this link with the name of the file which may or may not be uh, desirable. Like this .docx extension is not information that a student needs. You can edit the name of the link by clicking on the little context menu to the, at the far right end of this entry in the module. 
and select edit and you can edit that name that's about the only you can't edit the file you can just edit the name of the link that appears so i might take that ex extension out and update it that looks a little cleaner but you don't have to it'll still work fine all right so i've that's all there is to uploading content files to a canvas module and sharing them with your students within the module And files are one of the two major means of sharing instructional content with your students. The other major uh, type of content that you use, a content delivery that you use in Canvas is the Canvas page. So let's talk about how that works. I add, content to this module by clicking the add button here just to the uh, out, out here on the end of the line. I get that add item to module box again. And this time, instead of clicking um, uh, selecting a file, I'm going to select page and create a blank canvas page. I, it's a similar process. I get this create page button. In this case, that is literally true because a page is something you're going to create on Canvas, online, right, without having to create it offline and upload. So I'm gonna create a page. I click, click that uh, text. And I'm asked, the only thing I'm asked for at this point is the name of the page. And uh, let's say uh, in this grading started module, I want some instructor information. You got to tell them something about yourself, right? That first day of class. Well, this is how you can do it in Canvas without having to actually be there in real time. And then I add the item once again to the module and I get yet a second link that says instructor information. Okay, so what is a Canvas page and how did I just, <laughs> what did I just create? Well, I created a blank Canvas page. A Canvas page is a file, but it's a file that you create on Canvas instead of on your local computer. It is a web page, an HTML document, a hypertext markup language document, a web page. Uh, Canvas is at heart a web server and it's native, content format is a web page, uh, uh, HTML document. So that's what you're creating here. But you're going to be creating it using an editor that looks a lot like the um, uh, like something like Microsoft Word or any other text editor uh, uh, pages or whatever that you might use. But what I've created so far is just a blank Canvas page. And let's keep up with our um, content links cre uh, slide here. We're going to create now, and what we've just done is create links to Canvas pages in, and what we're, and we're going to develop that page in what's called the rich content editor in Canvas get to that one later. <laughs> so let's see how this works. Well, we've already created a blank Canvas page. To put content into that page, to actually provide information to your students, you click on the um, name of the page that's just been uh, the link of the page, or in the link that's just been created in the Canvas module. And you go to view uh, an area as a page where you can view the content of that page, which so far is just the name of the page. There's no content in it. But there is an edit button up here that will allow you to add content to that. And that brings up the rich content editor. 
it looks like a little brain dead version of Microsoft Word. Let me show you what it actually looks like. I've got it uh, magnified here so that you can see these things easier, but uh, it can't display all of the buttons and, and icons and so on. Let me shrink this down for a minute so that you can see it better. There's the full thing. What is that? Oh, that's uh, that's not one you'll say. But here's your complete Canvas um, rich content editor icon bar. And you have menus here. And you have a box into which you can type content, you can insert content, and so on. Um, I'm going to blow this back up again. Just remember that all these icons are here. We'll use them. Okay, that makes it a little easier for you to see because I know this can get a little fuzzy, especially if you're viewing this on a on a an iPad or a phone or something like that. It can uh, the sh the shared screens can be a little blurry. If you have trouble with that, let me know and I'll blow it up bigger. Um. <laughs> so, um, let's say I want to create an instructor information page. Now, I'm going to cheat because I've got one on another screen here. I've got this uh, um, completed course up on another screen. I'm going to just copy and paste stuff over rather than having to ins insert all of it from scratch or, or type stuff. God forbid you have to watch me type. Uh, online. So what sort of information uh, might I provide to my students on an instructor information page? Well, if I'm teaching an asynchronous online course, that is one that's taught entirely in Canvas, where the students may, where the students and I may never be online at the same time, and they may never see or hear me. That I don't recommend that, but uh, you can certainly, even in, an, uh, even in a, an asynchronous online course, you can provide lots of video and things like that where they see you and hear you and so on, and that's very important. But at minimum here for instructor information, what I'm going to want to provide to my students is a picture of me. That I know that seems trivial in some ways, but it makes more difference to students than you could possibly imagine, online students, who are perhaps never going to see you live. Uh, though, again, we don't recommend that, but some asynchronous online courses are run that way. They at least want to know what you look like, know that you're a human being, and not Robbie the robot or something. So uh, how can we put a picture into a Canvas page? Well, we have an images tool right here. If I mouse over that, it should. Yeah, it tells me that uh, that's the images tool. Uh, you sort of have to just try that or know that. That's why you're here today. Uh, if I click that images tool, I'm given this little interface here. And um, you're given a number of ways to pull up an image here, but by the vast majority of the time, you're going to pull it off your computer. You have it on your local computer. You're going to upload it into Canvas and put it on this developing this Canvas page that you're developing. Uh, the easiest way to do that, probably, uh, though, you can just drag and drop files if you're into that onto this little launch pad here. You can also just click the little rocket ship. And um, Canvas will open up a file manager dialog box, and you can search for uh, the file that you want, in this case, the picture that you want. I, I happen to already be in the right folder on my hard drive where this content is stored. So there's my picture. I can just select that and open it click the open button, Oop, which I'm sitting in front of. Sorry about that. Get myself out of the way there. Uh, that was easy. <laughs> I didn't even have to move. I didn't, didn't use any calories to do that. Um, I've got an open button over here. Right there in the lower right. I just click that. 
and that uploads the picture to Canvas. I see a preview of it. There's one thing I probably want to do before proceeding, and that's to add what's called alt text or alternate text. This is a description of the picture that will be read to a blind student who is using a program called a screen reader to access your course. And we're obligated to make these courses accessible to people with all sorts of disabilities, any sort of disability. And alternate text is a critical element for blind students. So I'm just going to call this Dave Pick. Maybe even type it correctly. Or if the image is purely decorative, which I certainly am not, um, and it doesn't need alternate text, you can click uh, this box here, and the blind student will be informed that this is just a pretty picture that doesn't mean anything. And once you've added your alternate text, you just submit. And that picture is added to your uh, developing document here. But in this case, it's way too big. Nobody needs to see that kind of close up of me. So I can click on the image and I get these little handles, the little blue squares at the corners of the image. And I can click and drag those down diagonally and shrink the image down to where it's a, a reasonable uh, size. Make it bigger and smaller. Uh, since this is a web page that we're generating, I can't just drag that image and drop it anywhere I want it, like you could do in a Word document, but I can put it. Uh, I can center it, or I can left justify it, or right justify it on the page. I do that by going to the uh, the alignment menu on the in the rich content editor and selecting left, center, or right. So we'll center that one. Okay, so I and just press enter to go down a line like you would on a typewriter, and there I've added my picture. So that's the first bit of technique here in, the, uh, in using the rich content editor in Canvas. All right, uh, the next thing I might want is some basic information about me, like my title, uh, my college or my organization. And I've got some of this content I'm just going to and you if you have this content in a word document or something you just want to copy and paste it in you can do that I'm going to copy that to the clipboard I'm going to come over here I'm going to center this content center my little cursor there and I'm going to paste it in up oh, and then of course it ignored that and I have to center it and I have to highlight it and center it again forgot about that okay so there's some information about me that I could have just typed in. But again, you don't want to watch me type or spend the time. Um, you also probably want to provide contact information. And the method which you want your students to contact you, through which you want your students to contact me, to contact you, that's why you don't want to watch me type. OK. And um, contact me by email. Well, they told me to learn to type. And maybe I type in my email address. And press enter and the rich content editor is smart enough to recognize that as an email address and it automatically creates a, a mail to hyperlink which the uh, students can then just click on and it will pull up their default email program then send you an email all right um you might put more information about managing uh, in the aid of managing expectations. I'll do my best to get back to you within 24 hours or something like that. Um, 
maybe you want to include a little bio here. And God forbid you don't want to watch, uh, watch me type that. So I've got this bio here. That I'll copy and paste in. I'm off screen here. Right. And um, that also has some information about the uh, about the topic of this putative course. Or you indeed might put in a uh, a little vid introductory video where you welcome the student. It's much more personal, much more engaging. The, a video that you've created uh, using any of the variety of tools you have access to at the SDCCD that will allow you to create a little talking head video where you welcome your students to the course that you can insert in this instructor information page by first finding the um, what's called the embed code for the video. Uh, that how you do that will depend upon where you have the video stored. In this case, I have this video stored on Canvas Studio. To access that, I'll go to the little electric cord icon here, which is the apps icon. They used to call this external tools. Canvas Studio is the video tool that's integrated with Canvas that you have access to for free by virtue of having a Canvas account. We will be doing an introductory session on Canvas Studio before long, but Today, we're just going to do the basics. I'm going to click on that little menu button there, and I'm going to view all of my apps, external apps that I have access to in our Canvas system. And this will vary depending on the, your organization within the district, but can you'll all have access to Canvas Studio, so I can click on that. And it'll bring up my Canvas Studio library without me having to navigate separately to Canvas Studio. And then I can um, oh, I didn't want to do that. On I can roll through my Canvas Studio library until I find the uh, video that I want to pick up. There it is. This is my course intro demo. I'll select that uh, uh, that video and then just click embed. So this is really easy if you've got your instruction if you've got your introductory video on. Uh, Canvas Studio, because that puts it right into the document, the web page that you're creating. There it is. And the students can play it right there from the page. So um, if I had had this on YouTube or something like that, I would need to use a little cloud or embed tool. And I'd be prompted for the embed code for the video, which I can get from YouTube, which is another session. But um, putting your uh, creating your videos, putting them on Canvas Studio, when you want to use them with your students in Canvas, is a really good idea because Canvas Studio and Canvas are tight. They're not the same uh, site but they are tightly integrated with one another. So that makes it real easy for me to put my video right in here. And I can make that video. No, oh, no, that's, that's what it's gonna be. All right, so now I'm, let's say I'm done with the page for now at least. I can just save it if I'm just in the process of working and I haven't created, finished creating it yet, or I can save it and publish it at the same time so that I don't forget to make it visible to students later on. <laughs> that does happen. So I'll save and publish it. So now I'll, this page is published, this Canvas page is published. Here's what it looks like to the students. If we go back to the modules tool, we 
we added that page through the module so that um, the link is here. The students can access that page just by clicking on that link and up it comes. They can play the video. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Giberson, and I'm going to be. And that's a lot more engaging than them reading this. And it's so easy to create that video. Join us for another session on how to do that if you're not comfortable with that. OK, so I've just created a Canvas page using the Canvas rich content editor. That's one of the big takeaways we wanted you to have from today's session. Dave? Yes. Um, what, is, what about using pages uh, as a like a header for your class? So that when the students go in, there's a visual that kind of represents the class. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. So we could use and then where would you would that be in your module one? That where that visual. Yeah, is like always uh, displayed every time the students go into the classroom. Right, right. You could do that, certainly. Uh, people will often create for the uh, getting started module or welcome module or whatever, will create a course tour. Mm. And they'll record themselves running through the course and showing the students where different things are, how to navigate the course, how to find things, how to submit a homework assignment, things like that. And that's something that's often included as a video. But mm -hmm. you can put in that Canvas page, you can put text, images, video, links to content outside of Canvas, and links to content inside of Canvas as well. So basically, you can build your entire course within Canvas pages. Indeed, that's generally that's one of the more common ways of uh, of building a Canvas course is just to build a series of Canvas pages and allow the students to go from one page to the next to the next and so on. Mm -hmm. And you can provide any uh, any type of information that they can view online, text, video, images, etc., cetera, uh, in any one page. So you're really limited only by your imagination and how you decide to uh, present your course to your students. So um, we've got the two most common types of content links in our module now. Let's see. Let's go back to the modules. All right, so I've got my getting started module. But uh, what about content modules? Uh, what about the actual instructional content that I'm going to place in the course? Well, I can make as many modules as I like. So once I'm I'm temporarily finished with my getting started module here, so I'm going to add another module, which will go below the first one. And I'm going to call this um, just module one. And I'm going to give it a subtitle. Uh, what is green casting and why? Do I care? I can call it Fred if I want to. You can title it any way you like. It might be chapter one and the title of the chapter or whatever, just some kind of information lets the students know what's coming. And I add that module, and now I've got a blank module. So what type of information might I add here? Well, we've seen how to add two types of content to a module a file as identified by the little paper clip icon here, and a Canvas page identified by this little document looking icon. The third type of content item that you can add to Canvas, to a Canvas module, is called a, an external URL or a web link. And let's say I have a web page or a website out on the uh, web, or somebody has one that I want to use with my, that I want to give my students access to that contains information that they're going to need for this course. Well, I can add that by clicking the add button for this module. And I can select from the uh, type item type 
menu here, an external URL. So I just need the URL, the web link, what appears up here in the location line on the browser when you visit that web page. And I need a name to describe what the students are going to find there. So I have to go out and get this URL somewhere. Well, I can go to another, I can open up another uh, page here. I can search for Google. Um, and I can search for screencasting uh, guide. And there's the one I'm looking for, <laughs> the ultimate guide to screencasting by TechSmith Corporation, who almost invented the technique of recording. The screencast is just a recording of your computer screen while you're showing people how to do something along with your voice. -up. So that's the, the subject matter of this putative course that I'm building here. And um, I'll to get the URL for that course, I, or for that page, for that site, I just click on it. And here's the URL, the web link for that course up here in the location line on my browser. I just copy that to my clipboard by pointing at it and right clicking and selecting copy. And I go back to my module and I paste that into this URL box here. Rather than trying to type it out because it take too long to type it and the chances of making a mistake are too high. Now I do need to give this a name so students know what they're going to be getting when they click on this link in the module. We'll call this the ultimate guide to screencasting. You do have to watch me type a little bit. And I can choose to load it in a new tab, or I can choose to just have it appear in the content frame in Canvas. I'm just going to let that happen and add the item. And we get this link. And in this case, it's all ready to go. All the students have to do now is click on this link to go to that site and view it and accept and whatever. So there's that web that website with all kinds of information about what I'm trying to teach in this course. So that's your third content type in Canvas. The third type of content that you can put into a module, a web link, as indicated by a little chain link icon. So when you're adding content to your Canvas course, you're going to be adding files, pages, and external links over and over again, multiples of each. And that's how you put the instructional content that you want your students to view into uh, a Canvas module. You just click the plus sign. You add perhaps a, a file, like maybe a, um, if I create a new file, maybe I have a PowerPoint presentation that would be of value to the students. I can upload that. Here's uh, uh, D, 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 it's there somewhere. Uh, D, D, D. Introduction to Screencasting, PowerPoint. Select that, click Open, that's all it takes, and then click Add Item, and that's all it takes to add, to upload that PowerPoint presentation to uh, Canvas and have the students be able to click on that and have the PowerPoint presentation come up fairly quickly. <laughs> it just depends on how busy Canvas is and how big the PowerPoint presentation is. It's not 2.6 megabytes, it's not too big. So there it is. And there's the introduction to screencasting PowerPoint that they can just scroll through. Um, and go back to the modules. So I can put all sorts of, of content into these modules in the form of files, Canvas pages, 
or external URLs or web links. And that's just, just a matter of rinse and repeat, continuing to do that. Any questions about adding content to your Canvas course? Instructional content and what I mean by that. Well, what else might you like to add to your modules here in building your Canvas course? Well, how about, well, we've talked about external URLs already. We've put in videos. How about assessments? Once you've presented all this wonderful content to your students, and that content may also include recorded lectures that you've created in Zoom or other by other means. Uh, so you can really provide the student asynchronously with a very rich instructional experience comparable to what they get in the classroom. And as we're going to see, uh, the students have access to communication tools where they can, that they can use to ask questions of you. Uh, just as they could in class. Uh, even though you're not online at the same time, they can do that asynchronously as well. But certainly you're going to want to be able to assess how well they've mastered the information that you've provided to them. And in Canvas, assessments include Canvas homework assignments, which <coughs> usually involve the student creating a file offline and uploading that to a Dropbox where you can access it and grade it and provide them with feedback and give them their grade. Or it may just involve you giving them a, a, a text box into which they can type something if, the, if what they're gonna type is not too long. Uh, or, uh, and these assessments are, this type of assessment is particularly valuable in an online course because it tends to be what's called an authentic assessment. In other words, it actually measures what the student knows and not how good they are at multiple guess. And it's much harder to cheat on because it's much more difficult for the student to pass someone else uh, to engage in skullduggery or pass someone else's work off as their own and so on. Um, so that's the first type of assessment we're going to look at here. Um, let's see how to create a homework assignment in Canvas. It's very simple, really not much more difficult than, certainly no more difficult than typing it out on a sheet of paper or typing it out in Word and printing it. Um, to add an assessment to a module, to add a homework assignment to a module, like this module one here, I just click that add item button that we keep using. And this time I'll select from this menu, the assignment option. That's what that means, homework assignment. And I create an assignment just as I created pages and files before. And I give the assignment a name. And I'm gonna call this screen casting definition. and add the item. So I get a, a link here in the module, <laughs> but wait, well, <yeah>, that was easy. <laughs> how did Canvas know how to, what you want? Well, of course it doesn't. That's just a blank assignment. If I click on the name of the assignment in the module, I get this page whence I can edit the assignment and actually create the homework assignment. So I'll edit that assignment. Um, I could change the name at this point if I wanted to, but I'm not. Uh, now I need to provide some instructions on how to, or on what I want the students to do to satisfy this assignment. And I have that <laughs> ready in, so I can copy and paste it. You don't have to watch me type those instructions. In your own words, define the term screencast. List three instructional applications for it. List at least two software tools that you use to create screencasts. Upload your submission as a Word document. Great. Um, the assignment, when you create it, automatically comes with an assignment Dropbox. And, and 
storage area in Canvas that the students can submit their work to. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. I do have to assign a number of possible points. If I'm, <laughs> this is going to contribute to my grade, let's say this is maybe worth 10 points in my grading scheme. I'm not going to worry about assignment groups and all this stuff here. What I will have to worry about is submission type. How do I want my students to turn this into me? And Canvas gives you several options. Uh, there might be no submission. This just might be a checkoff that you, you know, they tell you, okay, I've maybe a field trip and they show up for the field trip and you check it off in, in the grade book. But uh, it also might be an assignment if you're teaching in a classroom face to face and we're sooner or later, we're <laughs> going to be able to do more and more of that. Um, the student may turn it into you on paper and you just may use Canvas to store the grade so that the students can see how they did later. Or it might be an assignment uh, that is coming from an external tool like my math lab or um, uh, or a publisher's resource. But more often than not, it's going to be an online submission, which means that the students are going to do something online that submits that uh, work to you. And here are the online options. And they're basically two. These are just shades. These three in the middle here are kind of shades of uh, the main two, which is text entry and file upload. Text entry gives the students the rich content editor box and they can, they can type in it, they can insert images and videos and things like that. Or file upload allows them to create a file offline and then upload that to you in order to uh, fulfill the assignment. That's the most common type of assignment. If I select that, I'm given the option to restrict the file types that the student can upload so that I can be sure that I can open the file that they upload to me. You can, you can do that if you wish. If you choose that, you then ask to enter the file extensions that you will accept. Like if you want to, in this case, I specified a Word document. So if I want to make sure I only get Word documents, prevent and, and cause Canvas to not let the student upload anything but a Word document, I can put in DOCX, a comma, and DOC, which are the two extensions, uh, file extensions that denote Word, Microsoft Word documents. Or I can not worry with this and figure it out on the other end by just undoing that. Um, I need to decide how many times the students can submit this. The default is as many times as they want, <laughs> which is most likely not what you want. So I can select limited and I can limit the number of attempts. If I want to give them two chances, I can give them two or I can just limit it to one. I'm going to leave this at unlimited because I may want to piddle with it later. I can select plagiarism review if this is a writing assignment and I want to make sure that they're not copying each other's answers or downloading something off the internet to submit to me. I can uh, choose the plagiarism checker I want to use. Right now we have two. We have the old one that we've used for years called Unicheck, which is going away at the end of August, or Turnitin, which is the new one, which is available right now. And I'm not going to go into the my usual polemic about turn it in, but, <laughs> but I can select that or I can not bother. I can make this a group assignment if they're going to work on it in groups. I uh, want to worry about peer reviews. I can assign it. I can use this assignment block here to choose to whom I assign this. If I want to assign this assignment only to some people, the default is to assign it to everyone in the course. I can set a due date for the assignment by which time I expect them to have done it, maybe the end of the month. I can also set availability dates. If I don't want them to be able to start it right away, I can set an availability date upon which the assignment will become live. Or I can just let them start it whenever they like, which is more common. 
if I want to make sure that the students can't submit it after the due date, I have to set an available until date. The due date is not enforced on a Canvas homework assignment. Um, if a student tries to submit the assignment after the due date, they'll be told that it's late, but they'll be allowed to submit it if there's no available until date. But if I set an available until date, which is maybe the same usually as the um, due date, then they can't submit the assignment after the due date. And that's up to you how you want to manage that. So there's my assignment complete. I can save it and publish it, make sure it's visible to students. I go back to the modules. I can, uh, here's my assignment as indicated by this little assignment icon here. I can make sure it's published, it is, but I also have to make sure the assign, the module, excuse me, as a whole is published. If the module as a whole is not published, nothing inside it will be visible to students. And that's a common thing to forget. So now, if a student wants to submit this assignment, all they have to do, let's go to student view in Canvas. That's a neat feature that allows you to see your course as your students see it. All right, here, here's the link to the homework assignment we just created that my test student can now fulfill. Like the student clicks on that, they can they get the information they need, and they're told they have to upload a Word document. So at this point, they can stop, open up Word, <coughs> fulfill this, you know, create a Word document that fulfills the instructions here, and then come back here later and click Start Assignment. They don't click this button until they've got the Word document ready to upload. So they click Start Assignment, and they get the file, they get this dialog box. Um, if they happen to have created the file in Google Docs, they can pull it right from Google Drive. And that's ex that, and Canvas will accept it. But more likely, they're going to pull it. They're going to upload it from their local computer because they created the Word document on the local computer. <clears throat> so there's a button here that says "Upload File." They click that. They're then allowed to choose the file that they want to upload from their computer. A file manager pops up. They find the file on their hard drive. Uh, here's one. And it's a Word document, so it meets the instructions. Then I click Open. Yep, you can see that. <laughs> click Open. And uh, now Canvas knows which file to upload. To actually submit the assignment, the student clicks the Submit Assignment button. They get some feedback in a second that shows them that, hey, it worked. You, you just turned in your first assignment. And they also get this receipt here. So they're reassured that it worked, that their assignment has been submitted. Now, if I leave student view, for you to find that assignment, you'd probably go to the grade book. Here's my screencasting definition. I've only got one student in the course, my test student that comes with the course. I um, Here's a submitted assignment. That's what this little icon tells me. I can click on that. I can click the right arrow that pops up when I do that and go to the speed grader. And I'm going through this quickly. I know this is just an overview of this. And here's the grading interface in Canvas, the speed grader. Here's that student's uh, submission. I can read it. They were asked to define screencasting. They've done that nicely here. Um, they've asked, were asked for at least three instructional applications. Here they provided four. That's good. But they've only listed one tool. They were asked to list two. So I'm going to have to give them, I'm going to have to dock them a little bit. I can 
create rubrics that will allow me to automate this grading process. But in this case, I figure this is worth 10 points. Maybe the definition's worth half of that. And maybe the three uh, uh, instructional applications would be three points. And the, uh, the two tools that they can use to create screencasts would be two points. So they've missed one of those points. So I'll just give them a grade of nine over here. I type that in. I can provide feedback comments. One tool, question mark. And then submit all of this and submit the assignment as a whole, the graded assignment as a whole. And I have lots of other ways to provide feedback here. Join us for a our uh, session on assessment in Canvas. We'll probably run in September, late mid to late September, where we talk about how to grade in Canvas and so on. But this is the basic process. Uh, when you go back to the grade book now, the grade will be there. The students can access that grade from their grades tool, their grades link in there. Uh, of course, no, they can't see everybody else's grades, only their own. And that's basically the life cycle of an assignment, a homework assignment in Canvas, which is one of the three types of assessments you can do in, uh, you can create in Canvas. Uh, the next type, the next most common type, are quizzes, tests. Canvas calls anything from a, a pop quiz to a, a final exam a quiz. So when you create a quiz in Canvas, you're creating a test. The tests in Canvas can include all sorts of different kinds of questions. Um, rather than go through the entire process of creating a quiz right now, I'm with, oh, well, yeah, it's probably worth doing. Um, let's go back to Canvas. To create a quiz in your Canvas module, you just go to the module. And let's say I wanted a syllabus quiz here in my Getting Started module. I can add a quiz. There's an option for that. And I can create a quiz, give it a name. I'll just call it syllabus quiz. I've done that before, and I can save me the typing it and add the item, very similar to creating a homework assignment or, or adding a file or whatever. I get a link to that quiz, which of course is just a blank quiz at this point. Now let's make sure it's published so I don't forget that. I'll click on the name of the quiz there. I'll edit it. I have to tell if I uh, want instructions for the students. At the top of the quiz, I have to enter those here. That's probably not necessary in this case. Um, quiz type will be a graded quiz most of the time. You have some options that you can select on how the qu uh, quiz behaves. If you use multiple choice, multiple answer questions, you can have Canvas shuffle those randomly so no two students see them in the same order. Dave? Yes. Um, when you first started the quiz, I didn't see where you clicked. Um, so when you clicked on module one. When I added, clicked the plus sign and went to the menu where I had the different types of um, content that I could add to the module, one of yeah, those so options were, was quiz. Okay. Yeah, so you went up to the area where module one was and you clicked to create a quiz. Right. I tell you what, so when where I Where did you click? Once I get through with this quiz, I'll go back and I'll show you okay. that, okay? Okay, thank you, Dick. You bet. And um, I can set a time limit if I want. This might be, you know, five minutes at the outside. I can allow multiple attempts if I want or not. Probably not in most cases. I can choose what kind of feedback the students see when they, after they submit the quiz. I don't see any feedback until they submit the quiz and they can't change anything. But I can let them see their responses and their score, or I can let them see the correct answers as well, 
or I can take that off if I don't want to do that. If I just uncheck this, they'll just see their score when they submit the quiz. And they won't see the questions that they that were on the quiz. If I check that box, they will see the quiz. They'll see the quiz questions and they'll see which ones they got right. And they'll know, you know, the ones that they got wrong, but they won't see the correct answers unless, unless I click here. So you've got some uh, control over what they see when they submit the quiz. You can have the quiz presented one question at a time. Students hate that. I hate it too, but it's an option. Um, and you have the same assigned to block that you had with assignments. So you can set a due date and a display until date. Should probably be the same if you desire that. And save the quiz. But it's blank. Wait a minute. All I did was all I did was indicate how the quiz was going to be going to behave. If I want to add questions to the quiz, which would probably be a good idea, I have to click this questions tab here. And I can add questions that I create in Canvas one at a time, or I can pull questions from question banks that I have in Canvas if I have those. Create a new question like um, uh, a multiple choice question, though these are all the question types I can select and uh, or I can create in Canvas. Most everything you'd ever use on paper as well, and some that you couldn't do on paper. Um, so I'll select a multiple choice question. And let's see here, I've got this I can copy and paste from another place here. And to be quick about it, um, like if you read the syllabus, you can answer this question. Here's my question text. Question mark. When are assignments in this course due? And this is a multiple choice question. So if I scroll down, I have places where I can enter my possible answers, which might be uh, at the end of the current term. Whenever you feel like it. <laughs> or the day after you begin the assignment. <laughs> That'd be pretty harsh. And I can keep adding more answers. I can have as many possible answers as I like. I just gonna use those three. I do have to tell Canvas which one is the correct answer. Oop. That's not what I meant to do, sorry. Um, by clicking in this first column here, it so happens that the first answer here is the correct answer, um, but if you read the syllabus, but I can, you know, I can select whichever answer is correct. Canvas can't figure that out. When Canvas gets to the point where it can figure that out, they won't need us anymore. So that's not something we want to hope for. Um, <laughs> it'll be a brave new world indeed. And then I just update the question to add it to the test. And I can show question details if I want to remember what I did here, what the answers were or not. Um, I can also find questions in question banks if I have some question banks. And I do indeed have one here called Syllabus Quiz that I can select. It'll show you question banks that you have in other courses as well if you want to reuse those. But here's a some other questions coming out of the syllabus. Um, and maybe I'll select a couple of those. I can add those to the quiz and they show up automatically. And if I want to see what they actually look like, I can do the details. This is a, a so-called uh, drop-down quiz. Here's a true false question. And it's showing me the correct answers. It's not going to show that to the students obviously. And now I can save this quiz. And I published it before. So if I go back to the module, 
there's a quiz and there's actually a quiz underneath this now. If I go in as the student, my test student, I can take that quiz. Uh, here's a take the quiz option. Um, they won't see this link to Google it, but you got to remember that they can do that. <laughs> this is another Google um, app that I have active that uh, I forgot to turn off. But here we go. Uh, assignments in the course are due, well, at the end of the current term. And this is how they take it. Here, uh, hmm, that one's not working properly. I'm not going to worry about it right now. I, I goofed something in that question. Common. Grading in the seminar is pass, try again. True. And then the student can submit the quiz. Since I left the, uh, uh, the basic feedback options up, the students do see the quiz now. They couldn't answer this one. That was my goof. But they got this one right. Correct answers are hidden. But they see that they got one point for it, so they know they got this one right. I know they got this one right. And then they can just move on. Or you can prevent all of this from appearing by just unchecking that option when you create the quiz. So that's how quizzes work in Canvas and how to create one. The very quick uh, illustration on that, we do a testing in Canvas session where we go through that in a good deal more detail. But this is the basics today. All right, so now we have a quiz in there. The remaining type of assessment that you have in Canvas is, oh, and with Canvas quizzes, since they can Google the answers and so on, it's generally best to use these as low stakes assessments, which are more learning tools than assessment tools. And then finally, there are graded discussions. And those are just discussion topics, uh, bulletin boards where students interact with one another and with and with a question that you have um, created. And uh, they're graded on their participation. This is a great way to grade student participation courses. I'm gonna skip over that one for right now because we got about 10 minutes left. And there's something else I wanna cover. If I have time, I'll come back. By the way, that question about how did I get that quiz started? I clicked on the plus sign the add item button for the module, and I selected quiz from the drop down add item of type menu there. And that's how I got the quiz started. Then it get, I could I click create a quiz, gave it a name, and clicked add item. And that put the blank quiz in the module. Okay. Moving on. Um, once you have your uh, modules created like this, you have your course. When a student enters the course, by default, they'll be taken right to the modules. And they can start at the top of the first module and work their way down. And when we get to the bottom, they're done with the course. So they always know where to start where to pick up where they last left off, how to pick up where they last left off, and what to do next. So the modules give them a roadmap for the course that is almost impossible not to follow. So that's, that's a functional Canvas course right there. Once you have your modules all built out, uh, it's ready to turn loose on the students. And the students are gonna have a hard time getting lost in there. They'll still have questions and need help from time to time. And there are all sorts of communication tools built into Canvas that they can use to communicate their questions to you. We'll talk about that in a communications in Canvas seminar later on. 
But there is one other thing you want to might you might want to add to Canvas other than your modules with all the instructional material and assessments and communication tools linked into them. And that's what's called a course homepage, because this is kind of Spartan. It's kind of, you know, just the facts, ma'am. And you might want to make the student's first experience with your course a little more engaging. To do that, you can create what's called a course homepage in Canvas. That is just a Canvas page that is displayed to your students first thing when they enter the course. You create that by going to the Pages tool here in the course menu and selecting Add a Page. Remember, we created that instructor information page earlier. And that's in a module, but this is a page that's going to be outside the modules that's going to come up automatically when they enter the course. Now I'll just click add, uh, plus add page. I'll give the page a, a title like course home page. And then I have my rich content editor. So what can I put in here? Well, there's all sorts of stuff I can put in a course home page. I can put um, a, um, and I've got my course, I've got my course homepage up on another screen here. <laughs> I might start with a, a banner logo, uh, I, an image. I can add, go to the image tool. I can select upload image, click on the little rocket ship, and I have a little logo here that I like to put at the top of my pages that our online learning path pathways logo. So I can open that. And there it is. I can put some alt text on it. P logo. And I can submit it. And there it is at the top of my home page. Maybe I'll center that as I did before. Go out to the right here and press enter. Now I can start adding other stuff. I probably put the uh, type in the title of the course. And maybe I have a, a welcome video for that course on Canvas Studio. Oh, we've seen how to do that. I can, if I want to center it, I can put it over there and put my cursor over in the center. And I can, uh, if I have it on Canvas Studio, I can go to this icon. I can select Canvas Studio. I can look for, I have a folder in here with my uh, videos for this course. Let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Screencasting course videos. I can view that. Here's my home page intro. I can select that. I can embed that into my home page. My developing home page here. So there's that. And maybe I have also a little textual information about the course which I can throw in. Got to get down below that. Oh, come on. There we go. And paste that in. And there's one more thing I might want to put in here. It's on a course homepage. You don't want to leave the students at a dead end. Because this this one's not in a module, I can't just go to the mo they they could go just know to go to the modules and get started. But it's better to have give them an out on the home page so that they know how to get to the modules, or they can get to the modules just by clicking on something. I can type down here um, something like um, go to the course. I can highlight that and I can create a hyperlink 
here on the course. That's done with this little link icon in the rich content editor. And I can create links to content outside of Canvas or inside of Canvas, so-called course links. If I select course links, I get a list of the different things within the course that I can link to. And one of those is uh, my course navigation, the buttons in my course menu over here. If I select that, open that up, these are the various links that you see in the course menu over here. And one of them is the modules. That's where I want them to go to start the course. So I click that. That makes that uh, a link. Dave? Yes. I see the modules on, on above. Before course navigation on above? What oh, yes. That? Right. I could go to a particular module or I can just take them to the top of the modules. I can do it either way. Okay, thanks. So I could just go up here to modules and click the getting started module and send them to that. It would be the same result. Okay, thank you. Okay, good question. All right, we'll close that. Now that is a hyperlink. I can tell because when I mouse over it, it gives me these options. So I could keep adding stuff. I can put anything I want on this uh, homepage, but that's enough to illustrate the process. So I'll now save and publish that page. And theoretically, when the student enters the course, now they should see that. So I can test that by going to the home link here in the course menu. And that will take me to the first thing that the students are going to see when they enter the course. And darn it, they're still taking me to the modules. That's because there's one more thing to do here. This is, this is one process in Canvas that's not as intuitive as it might be. There is a choose homepage option under the home link in the uh, Canvas in your Canvas shell. Only you see this stuff over here. And um, one of those is choose home page. There are five different so-called entry points that you can choose. The default one and a good default is the course modules. But you can also pick a page that you've designated as the front page. How do you do that? Well, you go back to your pages tool or, or before you finish with your course homepage, you pull up your pages tool with the list of your pages in the uh, course. You go out to the right where uh, you have the on the line for the course homepage. You click the context menu button out here, and there's an option to use this as the front page. You select that, then you go back to the home button, and you select choose home page, and you select the option that says pages front page, course home page, because that's the one you just selected, and save that. And now when the student enters the course, they see this course homepage first. And now the course is ready for prime time. When the student gets dropped here, they watch, they watch the welcome video, hopefully. They read the information about the course. They, got, they have your contact information. And then they have this link that will send them to the modules and they can begin the course and rock and roll. And you now have a functioning Canvas course built from scratch. Um, your course is going to be more complex than this. <laughs> it's gonna take longer to do, but the process is basically the same. And you will then be ready to use this course, except if you have built this in a development shell, which we recommend, you will need to 
copy the content of your dev shell, development shell, to your teaching shells. How do you do that? Well, it's a very short process, thank goodness, because I know I'm running over here. Uh, but this I need to show you. Um, you go not to the development shell, but you go to the teaching shell, the, sh the blank shell that you're actually going to teach from. You'll go back to the Ooh. dashboard. You'll find that shell somewhere in your dashboard. Mine is, uh, dee, 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 dee. tell me it didn't move around. There it is. Um, Canvas teaching shell. This would have your, you know, your course information on it and so on. You go to the blank shell, the teaching shell, the new shell. You go in the course menu, you go to settings in the lower left. And you select import course content from the task menu over here on the right. For content type, you select copy a Canvas course, because you're going to be copying content from one Canvas course to another, both of which are on our system. This is a little different if you want to copy the content from a course you have at Southwestern or something like that on their system. But this is what you do here. If you developed a shell, if you uh, created a development shell or, or worked in a development shell on our system, wanted to copy that content into your teaching shell, you'd select copy a Canvas course. You'd then specify the course um, name from which you wish to copy, the source course. You just click in that box and if you've only got a few courses, it'll bring up a little menu and you can just pick the course you want to copy from. In my case, I've got way too many courses shells in there. So I'm going to have to start uh, typing um, the name of the course from which I want to copy until Canvas can figure it out. The, the, the title of the course from which I want to copy in this case is called Learn to Screencast. So I type learn. That's not good. Enough. And a space. And there, that was enough to pick up the one I want. Learn to screencast. That's the source course where they, that's my development shell. That's the course, or actually, that's not the one I was just working on. Let's do, um, what was that? It was, uh, development shell sandbox was the one I was working in. I'll almost always want to copy all content. Uh, so um, Dave, I'm sick. I'm confused as to which copy you were in the teaching shell. I'm in, I start in the teaching shell and that's a common question, a common problem. You start in the teaching. I'm in the teaching shell right now up here. Uh -huh. And I go to the settings. Yep. The settings link here. And I go to import course content on the settings page. Okay. That's where I go to here. Then I, that's how I get to here. Then I select copy a Canvas course. I select the course from which I wish to copy. Which is the development shell. The development shell. Okay. I select all content and click import. And that's it. You can sit here and watch this little dialogue play out, or you can just go and do something else now and come back later to your teaching shell and all of the content that you have created in your development shell will now be in the teaching shell and ready to share with your students. You don't have to wait here and watch this process occur. And once you do that, you're ready to go. And I finished my presentation for today. And I'll take questions, more questions now. You've, been, you've had some good ones as we've gone along, but I'll answer any questions you have about this process. And then after we finish with that, I'll answer any other questions that I can answer for you. 
Let me see if there's anything in the chat tool waiting for me here. Nope. So do you have any questions on anything I, that wasn't clear or that I neglected to cover that you'd like to know about creating a Canvas or developing a Canvas course from scratch? Do you yes, have I have a question. Okay, I'll take you both. Um, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, okay, can I can I copy um, a current course that I have into a development shell and then make changes in the development shell? Absolutely. And save that? Absolutely. That's okay, a great. strategy. If you've just finished a course and you've got the shell in pretty good shape, uh, and um, you want to move that content into your development shell and then massage it for next term, you can ask for a development shell and then copy the content from the teaching shell from last semester into the development shell, make the changes you need, like changing dates and things like that, mm -hmm. and then copy from the development shell into the, um, the teaching shell for the next semester. And that's a, a very one. strategy. Thank you. So I, I have a similar question. Good. I'm, te I'm teaching uh, two, I have one prep, but it's two separate times. So they're essentially the same course, but one is in the morning face-to-face, -face, one is in the evening uh, high flex. Ah. But the content is identical. So I'm wondering, ah. they gave me, uh, I'm trying to, I think they gave me two teaching shells. Yes, they did. So I'm kind of, can you give me some guidance as to the well, best way? Can to... you, what are your options in this case? Huh? Yes. Uh, well, you have a couple of options. One, you can, of course, copy the content from your development shell or from one of these teaching shells into the other. You know, you can always copy the content from one shell to another. So you don't have, if you have two shells, for the same course uh, in the same semester, you don't have to develop two courses separately from scratch. You just develop one of them and copy the content from one into the other or from a development shell into both. That's one yeah. option. Mm -hmm. The other option is to do what's called a course merge or a um, um, yeah, course merge. You can... Since the content is identical in the two shell, you can give all of the students in both classes access to a single Canvas shell. So you only have to manage one shell. But Canvas will set the shell that when, you, when the merge is done, Canvas will arrange things so that Students can't see uh, the students in one section can't see the students in the other section. Yeah, and I'm also thinking so about you, so you maintain uh, attendance. Yeah, you you don't have uh, problems with uh, FERPA, but um, that's another option and certainly a good one. There's no reason for you to have like as you're going through the term, you'll typically make changes in your courses. Uh, you know, you'll add new material, things that come up that you hadn't thought of before or that just became available or whatever. There's usually some, you don't usually have your course fully developed at on day one of the semester. Because you'll be massaging it as you go along. And if you have two sections with two separate shells, then you have to do those changes in both shells as you go along. Or you have to do it in one shell and then copy the change to the other one, which is also easy enough to do. But you can copy just one bit of change material from one shell to another as well. But that's more of a hassle. So you can drop all of your students into one shell. Even if you have three or four sections of the same course, you can have all the students access the same shell safely without violating FERPA. And to do this, you just have to request a, uh, a, a merge. And you do that by going to the help button in Canvas, which we saw before. And you, 
the same way you uh, you go to the same place that you do if you want a development shell. You go to either the chat, the faculty chat, or the faculty phone support hotline. You identify yourself as a faculty member at the SDCCD. You establish your identity in ways that they will, you know, that will be easy for you. And then you say, okay, I've got two sections of this course, and here's what they're called. And I would like them merged into one section. I would like the enrollments merged into one section. And I want to use this particular shell as the, the master shell, the one that I'm actually going to use going forward. And they will do all that for you. Uh, it is possible to give you the power to do that for yourself, but um, when we've tried that in the past on other learning management systems, it tended to produce suboptimal results. <laughs> it's This is something that's easy enough to mess up. That it's a lot better to have somebody who does it all the time do it for you. And uh, we pay Canvas, <laughs> we pay Instructure to, for them to do that for you. So you just call them up, give them the information they need, and they'll merge your two courses into one shell, and you'll just use that shell moving forward. How does it affect attendance? Um, well, we don't much use the attendance tool in Canvas. Um, it doesn't affect your ability to see who's doing what in your course. The, an, the student analytics are still available to you. Okay. So uh, it's not going to affect that at all. But attendance, of course, in an online, in an asynchronous online course is a, is a slippery concept because you have to ask, what does it mean? Uh, you know, does it mean the student went in and looked at the course uh, so many times in a week or does it mean they actually did something and submitted homework and things like that, which is usually the way the thing that we uh, use to gauge student activity in a course. But it's not like, you know, there's a class meeting uh, three times a week that the students have to be there and so on. If it's an asynchronous online course, they do the, they view the material on their own schedule in the, in their own order if, if you allow it and um they have to turn in their assignments and take their quizzes by a certain date but uh uh you know within those limitations they pretty much do things on their own schedule so there's not an attendance sheet really that you can uh that you can produce there is an attendance recording tool that's built into canvas that you do have access to but we don't much use it and we don't train on it much. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, I can get you some, um, some information on how to, how to add that tool to your course menu and how to, you know, like if you're using Canvas as a supplement to a face-to-face -face classroom course, you can use Canvas to record your attendance. Yeah, I guess I'm probably just coming from a place of inexperience because I used to, we used to take attendance. I, I'm an instructor at CE. Sure. And we used to take attendance, but that was back in 2020. And now I think the attendance, they have a census, which they. Right. So I don't know any, I don't but know much it, about it, it. So that's why I'm kind of confused. Right. If, if your course was fully online, and asynchronous, in other words, offered strictly through Canvas, there really isn't an attendance uh, sheet. Yes. You, you know, you can't tick off, well, a student was in here today, but not in here yesterday and things like that. It doesn't make any sense because the students are doing this on their own schedule. And they may not be, they won't all be accessing a particular module at a particular time. So, uh, but there are student analytics that you can pull up. Um, mm -hmm. oops, wrong screen, sorry. <laughs> uh, the new analytics tool here in the, that allows you to see, uh, well, this one, this is brand new course, so it's not, it doesn't have anything in it. Let me pull up a course that has had some analytics in it. 
Come on. Yoo-hoo. <laughs> there it can just. Uh, let me find an old one here that would have some data in it. And if I go, there's a, a new, for you, there's a new analytics button over here on the home page. You can go to that. And it will show you, you get grade, uh, grade data, aggregate data, we, online activity. And show and see what your students have been accessing. You can see what individual students have been doing. Mm. And you get useful information that gives you an idea of whether the students are actively working in the course or not. And you can pull reports on that as well. Okay. So that's kind of the way that you would take it. That's that's the way you would account for attendance or student participation in a fully uh, online async yeah. Canvas course. As yeah, a and I guess just because this is high flex, it's still considered uh, where the students have to attend. They right. can just choose so when they a, attend. In a high flex course, which is uh, you know the best of all worlds, you would probably find it appropriate to use the attendance tool. If you uh -huh. were required to maintain attendance records for high flex and, you know, and look at the Zoom meeting and, and, check and mark down who showed up for the Zoom meeting or pull up your Zoom attendance report that Zoom automatically generates and then compare that with, you know, your physical uh, checking off of attendance in the classroom and add that to it. And then you could record all that in the attendance tool that Blackboard does provide, you'd have mm -hmm. to add it to your course. To do that, you'd go to settings and navigation, the navigation tab here. Mm -hmm. I realize this is coming kind of quickly, but this is just the- Well, it, yeah, I mean, now that I'm kind of aware of it, I think I could ask, uh, you know, my uh, our chair and get more instruction on what they've sure. done or what they and plan could, on doing. And I could certainly be of help with that as well. And uh -huh. I- Maybe I do need to do a tutorial on the attend. Here's the attendance tool. Uh -huh. There's lots of things that could be in your course menu that are not necessarily included for students. <laughs> in order to add a capability to your course menu, you go to this navigation tab in your mm -hmm. settings, on your settings uh -huh. page, uh -huh. and scroll down below this line here. And uh -huh. here's all the things that you could be adding to your course menu and making available to your students. Mm -hmm. And there's an attendance tool. There it is. Okay. Uh -huh. I just click and drag that up. <laughs> I have to go several sweeps here and drag it up above the line here uh -huh. and then save that change. And now that will be that attendance tool will be available. Will be in the sidebar. Will be in your sidebar, and you can click mm -hmm. on that and use it. Okay. And there's a, it's a, it's an interface you have to learn. I, it's you can figure it out very easily, but I probably yeah. do need to do a tutorial on how to use. <clears throat> And, and I will check. I will check with my chair because I again I'm you see if you need to do that. Was teaching and now I'm new back to it, so right. I'm learning. But you do have this uh, uh, tool available to you if you need to use it. If you don't, okay. you can also get it, uh, participation and uh, reports out of the new analytics tool. Yeah. That would you know show what each how often each student has been in the course and what they've done and all that and so on. So okay. it's. Uh, you could you could report that sort of information either way. It just depends on what your dean wants you to do. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to work with you on that uh, once you get some more information, if you would like. Okay, great. I'm always happy to do one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions on request or to answer questions by email. Okay. You're welcome to email me at any time. And I always try to put my email address in the chat tool at least once. There it is. Feel free to email me at any time. Okay. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. Great questions. Uh, 
Don, you have anything? No, I don't have anything this time. <laughs> so, okay. All righty. Susan, and I'll see you next okay. time. Yeah. I was trying to talk on the phone too. Oh, yeah. I hear you. It was good to have you today. Uh, oh, okay. Susan, anything else that I can help with? Um, no, I have been emailing you a little bit back and forth, and yeah. you're really, you've been helpful. I've just, um, uh, have never taught in Canvas. I've never used it. I've been away from the district and now I'm back. So my You're head You're going to have a lot of questions. Yeah, my head is just, but good to know that you're, um, I was the one that asked about uh, closed captions in Zoom and you had sent me a screenshot right. of your, uh, your Zoom page, but right. my Zoom page did not have the... Oh, oh let me, let's take I a didn't look. Have, I didn't have the click that you wanted me to click on. And so... Um, Let's let's take a look at that real quick. Okay. Uh, okay. We can get to get to that option that will have your Zoom recordings automatically captioned. Yes. You go to uh, let's go to a new tab here. You go to zoom.us. Uh huh. Okay, the Zoom website. Uh, yep. Let's assume I'm not logged in here. Let me log mm -hmm. out. Okay. If you go to the Zoom website and you're not already logged into your Zoom account, you'll have an option to sign in. Okay. You click that. Uh-huh. You enter your email address that's associated with your account and your password uh -huh. and sign in. And you get these account management screens. Mm -hmm. the, Zoom, the settings that customize your account are found here. In this left hand bar. Yep. And there's settings. So that'll take you to the settings page. And there are a series of tabs across the top. Most of the settings are so called meeting settings. And okay. there's, there's about a blue million of those. <laughs> but if you want to make sure your Zoom recordings are captioned, you go, whoop to the recording tab here. Right, uh-huh. And you've got local recording options and cloud recording options. Okay. Probably so, you're going to be recording to the Zoom cloud. So I don't think I had all of that selection when you, because you did send me a screenshot. Right. But I don't, I don't think I had all of this do selection. You, do, huh, let's see. Well, and I don't know. Let me I don't know what this. do you have a Zoom, an SDCCD dash edu Zoom Pro account? Well, I I I don't have Pro. I did request a Pro account. And, ah, that's and so the... they they told me that uh, I had to like hit, kitty kitty back uh, onto piggyback onto somebody else's Zoom account. And well, um, thank you. now the other question I had about Zoom is that we only have 40 minutes of recording time? No, not with a Zoom Pro account. That's only oh, okay. true with a, a free Zoom account. With a right. Zoom Pro account, your meeting can run as long as your, your body will stand it. <laughs> okay. And as long as your students will stay online with you. There are okay practical limits to how long you can keep them online, but there are no, I have, I have accidentally forgotten to end a Zoom meeting mm -hmm. and had it run all overnight and into the next day. <laughs> uh, you know, I, usually I usually was... Zoom catches that and after a certain yeah. period, but I left something running so they didn't realize that I had left. That's and, funny. And it was a, like a 24 hour Zoom meeting. Uh -huh, that's funny. I quietly closed and, <laughs> and slunk off uh, and hope nobody noticed. But no, there's no limit on the number of meetings you can have. Okay. Class meetings or other meetings you can have. There's no okay. to the length of individual meetings. And you can have up to 300 students, God forbid, in a meeting with you. Well, 299 students in a meeting okay. with you. But don't mention that to your dean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and I, think I that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, and and so my class is heavy on demonstrations because I teach oh, a great. sewing class. Oh, so gosh. what I was 
what I was planning on doing. Uh -huh. And again, I'm so new. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, was, uh, what's your idea, though? What do you want to do? Well, um, what I'd like to do, so I have a morning session and an evening session, exact same class. So what I was thinking of doing was recording my demonstration. Right. In Now, the I could record the demonstration in um, uh, that I did for the morning class, or I could copy the um, the Zoom meeting that I had for the evening class, um, and then I thought I would then upload those meetings to Canvas, where yep. then the students could refer to the demonstrations and see them over and over again yes. to complete their assignments. And absolutely, you can do that. There is there is a consideration you have to take into account, and that's that if you're recording a Zoom a live Zoom meeting, the student picture, the student uh, images and names, at least some of them will appear in the recording. Uh huh. And you can't sh legally share that recording with the other section because okay. that would be a FERPA a federal rights and privacy act violation the, uh -huh. the students in one uh, section would know who the students in the other section were and that they were registered for that course and that is specifically prohibited by federal statute okay by the federal uh, FERPA mm -hmm. so what you can do with these demonstrations is you can record them in advance and you can then play them live for the students in a live meeting, but you can also put those recorded demonstrations into Canvas so that the students in either course can watch them whenever they like. So, so you're recommending not necessarily to record the demonstration in class while it's live. You're, you're recommending to pre-record right the, the meeting or the demonstration the demonstration and then up, upload it so there wouldn't be any students visible in correct. the demonstration correct and you correct. can use zoom to do that you just start uh -huh. a zoom meeting with no students in it uh -huh. right or, right okay so I just, yes I that's just that's a very good strategy um, uh -huh. another strategy is to take your zoom recording that has your students in it and edit it and you can cut out the students. You can blur or blur them out so that they don't show. That's a little more complicated and requires yeah. the use of a video editing program and knowing how to use it. But it might actually be less time consuming um, if you didn't wanna, uh, no, no, it really wouldn't be more time consuming. Yeah, because what I, what I, that would give me actually, because what I will probably do is that I will probably demonstrate in person for each section. Right. So that the students in the morning session, I'm there, I demonstrate the skill. Same thing with the evening session, I'm right. there and I demonstrate the skill. And then I have a recording of it and then I just upload it to the module for that week. Right. As long so as that would be more time consuming. Out the evidence, uh, the visibility of the students. Also, you got to make sure the students don't speak during the um, during the demonstration because their voices are also personally identifying information. Uh -huh. You can't share with the other section uh -huh. because people may have a distinctive voice that would allow people, other people to identify them. So yeah. it's a little bit of a minefield. So the, the safe thing to do is to make sure is to maybe do the demonstration live for both classes, but then take one of those recordings and cut out the demonstration and sanitize it so that no students can be identified and then post that to Canvas. Right, right. Or you can do, uh, or indeed, you can just post the recording for one class into their canvas shell and the recording for the other class into another canvas shell. But that means you got to keep your two canvas shells for your two sections separate. You can't merge uh -huh. them. Yeah. 
So you've got a bunch of options and, you know, there's ways to do this. And uh-huh. it's wonderful. I, I, absolutely a great thing to do for your students to have that recording available. But yeah. you've got to plan, you know, you got to do so it. The way, yeah. So the way I would, so there's a couple of scenarios just to repeat them so I understand. The first scenario is that I would do a demonstration outside of the classroom at my home and upload that to each of that upload that to my development shell of course I then we'll copy it right so that's one scenario that's one the other the other scenario would be to um uh record one of the demonstrations for example in the morning class but then I would have to edit it by blurring out the students Um, or uploading it to canvas yeah 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 and i did notice that there was a blur i I went in my clicking around i did notice something about blurring students um so does that also blur their names there's a blur tool in in zoom but it blurs your background it doesn't blur the students it just blurs your background when you're uh oh okay okay there video editors have blurring tools that allow you to blur just the students. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. And it wouldn't take long to do that, to cut the demonstration. If you're willing to learn the video editor, it really takes only a couple of minutes to cut out the piece of the recording that you want, blur the part you don't want the students to see, like the, uh, the, their peers' names up there and or their images, mm-hmm. and then render that out and upload that to Canvas. Mm-hmm. And it, it wouldn't take long, and it's not difficult to learn to do, but it's one more learning curve. Right, so right. There yeah. are, you know, that's, but that is a good option. And then you don't have to do the, or you can do the demonstration in advance and just play it during your live meeting. Yeah. Okay, and then they get the same benefit. And you, yeah, they wouldn't, question, you can yeah, they wouldn't the play uh, back and answer the question and then let them move on and so on. Yeah, you I could that. start and stop. I could start and stop, right? As, right. We're, as, exactly. as we're in the classroom watching it. Yeah, and you can the you can do that with the Zoom screen sharing tool and share the, the screen your screen when you're playing the video. And mm-hmm. The quality is excellent. The students will be able to see the movie just as, or the video, just as well as if they played it off of Canvas. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. they'll be able to hear your narration of it very clearly and so on. Zoom does that very well. So, Mm -hmm. and then that gives you a little break in the middle of of your class meeting because Mm -hmm. you have that pre-recorded. And you hit play. Yeah, hit it might for a minute and take a <laughs> and take a yeah. wig or well, whatever. It, it it may be that's a good it's a good strategy because it could be that with the high flex group, some of them at home and some of them, you know, in the class, it could be that the high flex students might get uh forgotten about or maybe they may feel like they're not as engaged oh, and so you share your screen live in the classroom though you can yeah. you can pro- you can project it up on the wall for the students in the classroom using the classroom projector and the students at home would see the screen share they'd probably see it better and hear it better than the ones in the classroom quite frankly and um that works fine that's that's a whole nother can of worms, the how to teach high flex. And yeah, that's offer, the road I'm offer, going down. We offer seminars on that as well. And we have recordings of all of these seminars. Uh-huh. Are, uh, are you familiar with our on-demand site? Uh, I'm not sure. I th- I've seen this, but I'm not, uh, I don't think I've clicked around. Here's the, let me, in the chat tool, let me put the, uh, I misspelled demand. Sorry about that. <laughs> but there's the link. I got that right. Uh, uh-huh. To our open on demand site. This is this, all of our video tutorials are stored here. 
including uh, that's like all the ones that I've seen you do. This is yes. really historical. Okay. And there's a you see this workshop archives button here. Uh huh. You click on that. All of our recordings are under uh, all. So, of, for example, the one that you did today, it'll be uploaded to it'll here. Be right here. Yeah. Okay. This is the one I the last one I did on the fourteenth. Actually, I've done one since then, and I don't have up there yet, but uh, okay. they'll be here. But if you want to learn about um, high flex, yeah, you can just search for high flex, and we have several sessions on the seminars on okay. high flex. Now, the 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 screen. I'm sure, where where did you get the open resource or the or the on demand? Uh, uh, I, it, uh, you can just type sdccdolvid.org in the location okay. line of the web browser and press enter. Uh-huh. Okay. This so sdccdolvid.org. Yeah. It's in the uh, chat tool. If you pull that up, you can click oh, okay. on it right in the chat tool and then oh be a, a safe thing to do or okay. write that it, we purposely made that url short so you could type it sdccd olvid okay. for ID. online video dot okay. org for organization so sdccd olvid dot org press enter on in the web browser and this will come right up it's also linked to the canvas help menus it's linked to our online Learning Pathways website, uh -huh. but quite frankly, oh, and it's also in every email that I send. Let me find. Okay, it's here. part of your signature, or exactly, mm. it's right there in my signature. Uh, oh, okay, so, okay. Uh, why is that not? Oh, so that would I could just search there for high flex. You you just pull up one of my old emails and, and okay. click on that link in the signature and then okay. um, um search for high flex uh in the on the site. Whoops. There's a search box and uh -huh. you search for high flex. Okay. Spelled funny. <laughs> that's the yeah. uvel well, spelling I've, for it mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh there and the we've done that we've done three seminars on that so far oh okay okay yeah I, i'm getting a tour in the classroom but i have no um you know no idea of yeah. how to how to how to work it um oh, and I then in, and then i've got two sections one in the morning so there's kind of a number of things happening in my brain <laughs> bless your heart <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm their guinea pig well if you had if there's anything i can do to help let me know yeah i i feel really good because i think i'm glad we finally connected because we were sending some emails back and forth so it's nice to uh have you be um you know face to face uh so. and um i'm trying to do, 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 do. I'm trying to do my oh here start video there so you can see me. <laughs> you know, my, there, you <laughs> camera, there you go. Okay, there I am. There you um, are. But it's it's good to be connected because I was sending emails and I'm, uh, you know, just being in this confused state. And I did reach out to Christopher, um, and he's we've got an appointment on Monday for him to give me an hour of his time. Um, you know, and I'll also have you out there too. I, I just don't know Certainly what the will. protocol is as far as how much I can abuse you guys. Oh, uh, no, that we're, you're not abusing anyone. They're paying me to do this. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be okay. compensated. So, and I, yeah. okay. the situation well, I you're in where you're not only having to learn canvas, but high flex. And yes. I don't know how familiar you are with Zoom either. So you've got a lot of well, learning the good, between the now good and the beginning of, of fall term. <laughs> yeah, the good thing, yeah, I've got a month, basically. The good yeah. thing about it is that I'm not, I, I was, I'm back to teaching. So right now I don't have a, a position and I'm just at home prepping, which is, Thank I'm God. really lucky. That really is helpful. Plus I have two, um, 
I have two 25 year olds in my house. So they know everything. <laughs> They know everything about Zoom and everything the about Zoom. Familiar tech support. Everything. I am familiar with the concept. <laughs> yeah, and, and she is about to kill me, but she has been a major resource. If I was here by myself with you no know, younger generation person, um, so she's been helping a lot. So Zoom, sending invites and all of that, she helped me, and I feel good about that. Good. So now, now it's just um, going to like exactly what we went over this morning. I But maybe before Monday, when I work with Christopher, I've got some experience adding modules and, you know. Right. You, you've heard some of the words. That alone yeah, makes yeah. a difference. Well, and I was clicking around yesterday and I, I saw that homepage thing and, and I took a picture and I wanted to do a banner, but then I couldn't figure out how to do it. So well, I'll... Um, Knowing the the gun that everyone is under right now with the fall term roaring down upon us, yeah. I will get this one, the recording that we did, this recording that we're making right now, online as quickly as possible, hopefully by the end of today. Oh, so that would be great. It, it will be in this, you know, if you go to the on-demand site and go to the workshop okay. archives, uh -huh. Uh -huh. it will be right here in the upper left, be the latest one. Oh, okay. Okay. In so, the upper left? Yeah. That's okay. the latest ones are show in the upper left. And then gotcha. you can scroll down. There are 12 a page. And there are 33 okay. pages of recording. Okay. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, if you do search for Canvas, of course, <clears throat> rats. <clears throat> I've done this one a couple of times before. <laughs> so the recordings for those, okay. which are essentially identical <laughs> today, are there already if you need something before this evening. Okay. Okay. We, Great. we do, you know, some of these sessions we do over and over again because new groups Absolutely. come through or people just want a refresher. So, well, and yeah, and you, you know, when you hear something one time, maybe you kind of remembered a few things. When you see, when you hear something two times, okay, you've heard it a second time, but you still don't know what you're doing. Repetition and then the third time, is the soul of learning. Yep. Yep. I forget and who so, said that. I wish it had been me <laughs> the first time. <laughs> But that's really me. Hear, hearing it more than once sure helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's nice to stop and start. So when I when I replay a video you guys do, I'll stop and then I'll, you know, do that little section that you just did, you know, so it helps oh, yeah. me. Yeah, so that's that's kind of been something. Oh, so, you're um, yeah, you're selling it for us there. <laughs> and think about, <laughs> think about your students. Yeah. How well, that, definitely... that will be to them as well. Uh -huh. so if you need any help recording those demonstrations, I don't know how familiar you are with that sort of thing. That mm -hmm. is my, that's one of my things. I, I've got okay. a. Well, you know. it might be that um, so my setup at home, all I have is an iPhone. I haven't purchased a, a camera, yeah. but it could be. The iPhone is wonderful. Oh, Okay. But it could be that I can do the recording of the demos inside the classroom rather than doing them at home. I don't know. That's another there. possibility. But quite frankly, your iPhone is a marvelous video recording tool. That was a big part of the seminar I did two days ago that I haven't got okay. online yet on uh -huh. instructional video production. You carry yeah. an instructional video studio with you in your purse. Uh -huh. And um, the iPhone is great. There's one suggestion I would make to you if you plan to use your iPhone to record your um, uh, demonstrations, yeah, which is a very good idea, is uh -huh. to get yourself a tripod and an uh -huh. adapter that will hold the iPhone steady so yeah, that you're not trying to... My, yeah. You don't have to spoon one of your kids to stand there and hold the iPhone <laughs> and shake and get tired and so on and drift around and okay. while you're doing the demonstration because it's hard okay. to hold the iPhone and so at the same time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So that that but given that that the iPhone is a terrific video. Okay. The cameras in the iPhone are better than studio cameras. 
that cost a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Fifteen years ago. Okay. okay. And are, then, and then the once the video is recorded, then I have to learn how to save it and upload it. Right. Um, so that's the next piece. And that very piece is in the recording I will post next. Oh, okay. It's titled instructional video recording, and it's the the first part of that seminar was exactly how to record using the iPhone and how to okay. get it online. Oh, and which where, where was the, where is that? Is that the on demand? That will be on the in the workshop archives. In, um, uh, come on. There we are. It will be right here in the workshop archives, right in the upper left. Though, just a second. I think. Would you mind sending me the link to that? I, I may be able to do it right now because I already have it up on YouTube. I just don't have it in the on-demand site yet, I think. Okay. There it is. Look at that. Just a second. Okay. Pulling up the link, I'll give it to you right now because this will be a slightly different link because it. I put these on YouTube and then I link them into that on-demand site. Yeah. So you can go through that. But I have the, I have the right here. I'm putting it in the chat tool right now. This okay. is the instructional video production recording. And I, I, I think it's, yeah, it's ready to go. Okay. Now, um, there's, there's the link in the chat tool. Okay. So you I should that, just... That'll take you right to the YouTube page of that on. Okay. And the first, let's see, I haven't set... I haven't done the table of contents yet, but I think that's the first, what you're interested in is, let's see, the first. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's professional. Uh, let's see, where is that? So now, um, because I'm in, I'm looking at your screen, I'm looking at the chat tool, but then right. how do I go from the chat tool to if to I the link. The well, link, yeah. you, you want to bring up the chat, your chat tool, not mine. <laughs> if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a little chat icon. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, uh huh. And if you click on that, the the chat box, like you're seeing on my screen, should show up. And uh, the link to that video is in there, and you can click. It's a clickable link. You can click right on it. Your computer will open up a web browser and pull up this video that you're seeing me. So I'm a little confused when you say your chat tool versus my chat tool. No, it's the same thing. It's the same. This is just, I'm just, okay. view, we see the same thing. This is just uh -huh. what you were seeing on the screen a minute ago was me looking at my chat tool like this. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So I have, I have the address up here. If I select it, because I'm in Zoom, I have to I have to minimize Zoom then, right? No, it, you, actually, probably the web browser will pop up over top of Zoom if you click on it, most likely. But if not, yeah, you might have to minimize Zoom. And, and okay, okay, all right, there we go. I just got it. Yeah, okay. Right. And so this but, is the link to the recording um, Zoom. On how to use your iPhone. Okay. To make video and get it online, and I'm just looking to see what, how uh, far into it that part went. Uh, d d d d d d d d d uh, quite a ways. It's about the first 56 minutes of the uh, recording. Uh huh. You'll you'll know when it's done. <laughs> that uh, that took longer than I thought, uh, but the the process is a lot simpler than that uh, uh, length of time would suggest. I was answering questions as I was doing it and things like that. But that will show me actually recording a little demonstration video, showing my little TV studio here, and mm -hmm. then put it. Uh, actually recording it using the iPhone, putting it on YouTube, and then sharing it with students. 
Okay, yeah, because that's an, I, that would really help because there's that piece. What's the difference between Zoom and and YouTube? Because in the CERT program that I did two years ago, um, you know, the online instructional uh, certification program, they didn't show anything about Zoom. It was all about YouTube and recording uh, videos on YouTube and uploading them. Right. And so that uh, Zoom mastered and no, that, that, that training that. course that the district does is strictly for asynchronous online teaching oh, okay it's canvas and not zoom okay <clears throat> yeah that's what i was yeah. noticing mm -hmm. yeah. and that's because uh, uh well historically zoom wasn't uh, real-time interaction wasn't much used okay. in mm -hmm. online education okay. for the longest time. It was mostly so, asynchronous through Canvas. So I could really defer to Zoom to do all of my video making and recording yes. and then take those Zoom recordings and create YouTube uh, uploads, correct? Yeah, though if you, if you use Zoom to record uh -huh. things, yep. you can record directly to the Zoom cloud and you can link to the recordings in the Zoom cloud directly without having YouTube being involved at all. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, the reason I mentioned YouTube here is you were talking about using your iPhone. Uh huh. And it's once you record a video using your iPhone, the easiest way to get it online is to use the YouTube app on the iPhone to upload it to your YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. But that's almost automatic. And okay. It, there are other ways to do it, but they're more complicated. Mm -hmm. But if you were using Zoom to do your recordings, uh -huh. um, which you can do, and there's, you can even use your iPhone in Zoom as a camera and, and use it and have <laughs> record your demonstrations during a Zoom meeting using your iPhone as a camera in Zoom. And, yeah. uh, but that all gets more complicated. The simplest possible thing to do what you're describing in terms of filming your demonstrations is to film them with your iPhone, and then you can send them directly to YouTube from the iPhone. You don't, uh, there doesn't have to be a computer involved or anything. And once you get it on YouTube, it's very easy to share it with your students in Canvas from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the path of least resistance that I can think of to do mm -hmm. what you're talking about doing with your sewing demonstrations. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I've seen that sort of thing done before in the fashion uh, field, and they've been exceptionally effective. So it's yeah. a great, great idea and a great mm -hmm. thing to do for your students. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just trying to give you a path to that that is as simple and as quick as possible because you got a lot of <laughs> demonstrations to, <laughs> to Yeah, well, speak. yeah, I'm I'm very familiar with the content. So well, understanding the content is not a, a problem for right. me. You're the content it's, expert. It's just Yeah, I'm the, exactly not what the technology, yeah. Yeah, so what what I don't know is the is to how to record and upload and do all right. of this video and all of that. And I don't, I don't understand Canvas uh, that well. So that's the piece. Um, well, that that the first hour or so of that uh, session will go through all of that for you. Okay. Okay. And give all you right, yeah, so a place I, to start from that. anyway. And when you inevitably have questions, because no mm -hmm. presentation is ever perfect, you know, yeah. get in touch with me and ask them. Okay. Okay. That's very good. Well, let me, um, I'll send you that email um, about, about the uh, Zoom account. Zoom Please. Account. Yeah. 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 That's a, or about anything you, you want, but the, about uh -huh. being denied, told you had to piggyback on somebody else's Zoom account. Yes. No, 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 no. That wasn't the deal. <laughs> we want to, we want to. Yeah. We, but I didn't feel somebody comfortable. Somebody got some explaining to do. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't comfortable with sharing my information no. with somebody else. Yeah, yeah. So I'll send you, I'll send you that email, and then I'll start pushing around here. Um, and I'll now that we're connected, um, you might regret it. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I I repeat, it's not like you're 
imposing upon me. They pay yeah. me to do this and they pay okay. me by the hour. Okay. So okay. You don't have to worry about using my okay. time. That's what they're <laughs> paying to do. So okay. and, and I I love it. This is I'm a teacher. Yeah, no, you're very good at it. Yeah. I, I'm a teacher at heart. I've been teaching for one way or another for 45 years. Yeah. I yeah. just miss it so much if I didn't get to do it. So you're yeah. doing a favor as well. Excellent. Well, I think you're going to be a great resource, Dave. So I'll, I'll do all of this and I let me get on and create some modules. Excellent. Let okay. me know if you have questions. So I have new questions for you. Good. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Take care, Susan. Look okay. forward to hearing uh -huh. from you. Thank you. Bye.